William, are you, hopefully, are you there? William is here. I don't know if you can mm -hmm. see my screen shared already. I can see it all. I can hear you. It's all good. So I'm going to clear off and uh, the stage is yours for five minutes, my friend. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody, for joining. So I'm, as you've heard, founder of the Academy of Robotics. The key is in the name, Academy of Robotics. And I'm going to make the case today that um, some of the biggest changes that are required to make us go greener and more efficient are not necessarily the big innovations or the big multi-billion dollar projects, but it's sometimes the little things, the software. And I'm going to make a case for what I call artificial intelligence for good or for the use of good causes. So to help you understand this, I'm going to take you back 15 years, well, more like 14 years, where I thought I came across something. Transport is the most polluting sector in the UK. This was a study by the UK Department of Business. Um, this is a few years ago. And I thought, do you know what? I have a solution that could solve this. So young me at about 23 years old, decided to go to BBC's Dragon's Den, where I met the dragons and I pitched my idea, a very fun, cool, crazy concept where I showed a street litter bin. But this wasn't just any bin. This was a bin were complete, which was solar powered. It would light up at night. And more interestingly, it wouldn't just light up, it would show people where ads are so that the ads pay for the bins, the local authorities get them for free. In the bin, I added very cool tech, a GPS tracker, so we can track where the bins are. And we can also tell when the bins are full. Why this mattered is, we could actually reduce the numbers of journeys made by giant trucks going back and forth to empty bins between 20 to 75%. Pete Jones said it's the biggest pile of bull he's ever heard in the den. Theo Perfita says I should be wheeled out in that bin and never to return again. And that was my sort of first flirting with the concept of transport is the most polluting sector in the UK. Now, to bring it more to today and how this relates to today is we've all probably got so many delivery boxes at home because of one of the most expensive and biggest problems in the world called the last mile problem. What this simply means is we could have something shipped from China to your house for next to nothing. But when it gets to your local depot, the cost goes up exponentially. And now it's a van driver who picks this up because of the pressure of next day delivery, delivery tonight, these vans are going out mostly empty, causing one of the biggest problems, which is vans on the road all the time, leading back to that original statement, transport is the most polluting sector. So currently, companies are trying to innovate around this, creating these, for instance, these cool knee-high robots that will take on this load and automate these electric little pavement ferrying robots. Very cool, I love them. The only problem, however, is how do you scale this? Um, so, so it's yet to be seen if this can be scaled, but we're not very optimistic. Next one, everyone loves drones. Yes, let's put drones in the sky, they're electric. Uh, no, it's not gonna happen. You may ask me why. Um, I've actually flirted with drones myself. I actually filed a patent, perhaps nearly 10 years ago now, for an invisible road network in the sky which drones can use to navigate from point A to point B. The reason I abandoned this idea is simply this, the Public Space Protection Order of 2018. It's a weird little bylaw most people don't know even exists. This means that if you go over 80 decibels of noise in a residential area, you are in breach, you will get fined, and there is now legal precedent. I think some boroughs in London and out of London have already started installing cameras. I didn't think, I know for a fact. Um, these cameras will record noises such as your car engine revving too loud or anything you do that takes it over that 80 decibels and over 200 fines have already been issued. If you know anything about drones, they go way above the 80 decibels and no one's making them silent anytime soon because the military has been trying to make helicopters silent for decades. So, back to the statement, transport is the most polluting sector in the UK. What I decided to do is I then, after I exited my last company, went to university and thought, you know what, 
I think I could automate this last mile section. Automate it by putting self-driving cars that are electric that will automate this process. So that's the solution. Let's make everything electric, electric, electric. Or is it? The problem with electrifying everything is it'll take a long time and it's very, very expensive. Now, I didn't have a billion dollars, nor did we as a company. So when you don't have a billion dollars, you begin to innovate. Going back to that original situation I had where a small, silly idea, such as being able to tell when bins are full, could reduce significantly the number of vans or number of sort of rubbish trucks in a certain in certain parts of the UK. So following this logic, we've all seen my company's little spaceship cargo, the green autonomous car. But the true magic is what actually happens with that car. So the first thing is we then automate the delivery run. So when a person wants their delivery, they press one button and a little electric car will go pick up the package and take it to their house. So no more vans. But again, this will take a while to scale. And so as a company, which um, makes software, we start, okay, fine. Let's, let's make it like a modern taxi app. You press a single button. After you press the button, that software kicks in and then it drives itself. So let me just explain what's happening. We've tricked a computer processor into it's you driving yourself home. That is science fiction level technology. If we can go that far, where else can we go with it? And so as a robotics company, which innovates and makes our own hardware and our own software, we started designing new types of sensors. And so I ask a question, what can a sensor do? So I want to show you a quick clip. I hope you can see it while on my screen because these things are temperamental sometimes. So this is actually a vision system for one of our cars. And I'm going to slow it down here. What you're actually seeing is an auto, oops, that's too, what you're actually seeing is an autonomous cars heat system. So there is a van driving past here. So up to two minutes after at night, we know exactly where that van went because we follow the heat signature. And then we train AI to be able to predict what's going to happen with that road in real time. And that's just the beginning. The next bit, which is more exciting, you'll find out in five minutes after a quick tea break. That's me for now. Join me in five minutes. And yeah, we'll show you some more really cool stuff. Thank you very much, William Out. We're live in sunny Banstead. It's actually raining today. Banstead in Surrey. Um, we're actually doing autonomous delivery trials here in Surrey. What this means is, I'm just checking to see if our cars on its way. What this means is we have autonomous vehicles that we have designed and built that are on the road right now here in the United Kingdom. Elliot, we, uh, we are waiting for you, Elliot. So behind, behind me right now, in a minute, you shall see Cargo, the UK or Europe's first autonomous delivery vehicle. I'll be giving you a quick tour of what the tech is and what it does in a minute now. She's going to walk towards the road and there is cargo coming. So cargo, safe to drive a lights on, please. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. There we go. And there is cargo, the autonomous delivery vehicle. I'm just going to take over pilot ship off this here. So as you can see the vehicle safety driver, do you mind coming out please? So under current legislation in the UK, we're required to always have a safety driver. We this, can't see the picture, William. It's, oh, oh there it's, you go. is it back? We're required to have a safety driver. This is an individual who can take over at any time if anything was to happen and go wrong. So safety driver, can you open the hatch please? So um, what you see right here are some of the sensors that we have on cargo. So these are a different type of hybrid camera we designed, which links in with the sensors at the bottom of this vehicle here. Um, if I go back towards the, towards the back, something really interesting is what we call rerouting. We always try and figure out the most efficient route. What this means is we could carry up to a dozen packages at once, and with these up to dozen packages, we're able to 
essentially change the order based on what is the most efficient route to take. So there could be traffic down that road or you could be stuck for a while. We, we don't want to cause additional traffic. So what we do is the car uses robotic technology within the vehicle to be able to adjust. So inside, we're going to go to the safety driver's compartment here. There are screens which are giving them live reports. I mean, they're off at the moment for now. I'm um, actually one of the first people to see inside, what we see from inside. And I'm going to take you around towards the front to the shark eye cameras. So these cameras here are very different type of cameras. Again, we can tell heat, we can see night vision. And again, all these things are designed to optimize and make the experience better for being able to be a cleaner, greener vehicle that doesn't cause traffic on the street. So cargo is the result of pretty much three or four years of work by a team of very smart people, artificial intelligence and robotics PhDs. And we've been working on this to be able to create this vehicle. This is the first one we have on the road and we hope to be building more later this year and we'll have quite a lot later towards the end of the year. We started in the borough, London borough of Hounslow where the local authority and ourselves, we partner with a company called Eurovia, which is a specialist company in making sort of making roads and repairing roads and whatnot. And so we have what we call chin cameras, cameras which are underneath the car, which are able to, you can just see a little protrusion there maybe. These cameras are able to detect road sort of obstructions and tell when the road is gonna break and predict what's going to happen next on the road. So we never had a billion dollars. And so we spent all our time <laughs> just innovating to create better software because we believe artificial intelligence can be used for good. You see today, a lot of AI tries to sell you something. This doesn't. The vehicle is there to be there when it's required and out of the way when, when it isn't. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm William from the Academy of Robotics. And this was my presentation on artificial intelligence for good. Thank you William, William, thank you. I don't know if you can hear me, but we salute okay. you. We salute you. That was, that was definitely out there. And there, if there's one thing I've learned in my journey of life is be excited and interested in people who are out there and uh, going for it. Um, so I wish you well. It's definitely green. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> it's amazing. Well done. And, and, and I love the way the drivers dressed up into um, the future as well. He, he, <laughs> yeah, he looks like he's from 20. He's fully kitted out our safety driver. He's got his pockets full of tools and all that stuff. And so if anything happens with autonomous vehicle, him and the command have always have absolute control. It's amazing. He looks like he was born in 2035. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we aim to try and bring you tomorrow's technology today. I'll see you on the live panel, people. Thank yeah, you thank you much. very much, William. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And okay. thank you, your driver. So, Sergei, look at that. This is the kind of event that you're part of now. Um, interesting, different. And um, let's be honest, we all need a we all need something exciting these days with all the rubbish going on with you know what. So welcome to the stage, Sagai. I, I'm just going to tell everybody, um, I have vested interest in that I know who you are. I know what Zero Avia is because I'm on the advisory board. So I just want to make that declaration in case people think I'm being particularly nice to you and <laughs> saying how much I like electric aviation. Um, but I do anyway. I did before all that. Um, so, Sagai, please come and tell us about Zero Avia and the exciting activity that's going on here in the UK. The stage is yours, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Roger. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, it's very exciting. Can you see my, uh, my screen? Yep, got it fine. It's not in presentation mode at the moment, yeah, but I'm yeah. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, it is now. Yep, thank okay, you. Very excited to be with you, and uh, you know, similar to uh, to William, uh, we are a small company with uh, large aspirations. Uh, I think uh, we will talk uh, a lot about the world uh, first uh, today, and uh, uh, also we are um, we are in the you know sunny uh, central Bedfordshire right now, and uh, um, unfortunately, I cannot be next to our airplane uh, because uh, now my engineers are doing some. Uh, Really interesting uh, new phase uh, of testing of uh, of the new um, uh, new setup, uh, which will allow us to uh, to do longer and nicer missions. Uh, so um, I will talk about it uh, today. But um, 
Uh, let me just uh, give a couple of uh, words of introduction in uh, in Zero Avia. So uh, we, are, we 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 talked uh, you know quite a bit today uh, about the ground transportation, and um, uh, I guess now it's time to switch gears and uh, maybe a, a couple of words of inspiration or aspirations uh, why we are doing this. Um, in uh, in general, uh, we are, we started uh, we, we we got into the. Uh, aviation market uh, uh, after we worked uh, uh, also uh, a bit with Roger on our previous startup. Uh, it was uh, uh, eMotorWorks uh, in, uh, and we created uh, the smartest uh, charging uh, uh, vehicle to grid in integration platform uh, for electrical vehicles, which we sold uh, with our founder and CEO a few years back. And then uh, uh, we, uh, we were thinking about uh, what is next. And um, another big challenge, uh, of course, is uh, given, uh, again, the fact that uh, my founder and CEO is, uh, uh, is a pilot, is, uh, of course, the aviation, okay? And uh, aviation is actually on the brink of uh, quite a significant uh, uh, crisis because uh, uh, given that it's uh, one of the hardest uh, things to, uh, uh, to electrify and uh, to decarbonize, uh, uh, we understand that uh, from today is about uh, five to ten percent of emissions uh, or environmental impact which we have today from aviation. If we don't do anything, uh, we will get uh, to something like a quarter or half of the all the environmental impact of humankind uh, by 2050 coming from aviation. That's why we um, we venture in this journey. It's a huge uh, huge market. Uh, huge challenges, and uh, we started this uh, this journey a few uh, a few years back. With uh, first, we were thinking about um, uh, uh, maybe trying to do something with the batteries because we, we knew how to uh, uh, electrify things and how to manage uh, electrical vehicles. So we thought that the, the batteries were the answer. But then, when we did the calculations, it it turned out that uh, batteries will not do the job because. Uh, because of the gravimetric uh, energy density, okay? So then the next thing uh, was to, uh, to think about uh, hydrogen. And uh, I think that about uh, two, two and a half years ago, we started this journey. And uh, about a year ago, frankly, nobody talked about hydrogen, hydrogen and aviation. And um, after we uh, increased the profile and uh, started to, uh, to talk to different people, now you see that uh, hydrogen is one of the most uh, uh, visible and important topics uh, in aviation. So uh, recently there was a huge uh, report uh, published by the European Commission and uh, the Clean Sky. Uh, uh, um, uh, Airbus uh, announced that uh, in the next, uh, let's say 15, uh, 30 years, they will have uh, introduction of uh, uh, large uh, aircraft uh, flying on hydrogen. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, uh, we uh, actually believe in a small incremental approach. That's why we have uh, uh, a small turboprop, uh, which is uh, you know, she, uh, shown here in this diagram. We, uh, uh, we are trying to do this step-by-step uh, you know, -step, uh, uh, approach and uh, uh, develop sort of closed um, uh, ecosystem, and which we de demonstrated here in, uh, in Cranfield. In a nutshell, it, uh, it consists of the green hydrogen production using uh, uh, renewable power generation, using, uh, of course, this uh, uh, green electricity and uh, water. We produce uh, green hydrogen, which then goes into the aircraft, uh, into the uh, either gases uh, storage tanks or liquid hydrogen uh, uh, storage tanks. Then uh, this, uh, this gases uh, hydrogen goes into the fuel cell, which produces electricity. And then, uh, uh, which drives uh, electrical motors and uh, and propellers. And this is uh, exactly where we started. We didn't start with the large uh, aircraft. We started uh, sm with the small uh, six seat uh, uh, airframe, which um, some of you might have seen uh, in uh, in the news in uh, BBC, in Sky uh, Sky News, uh, uh, etc. So, in a nutshell, what you see up front um, behind the propeller. Uh, is uh, electrical motors, which are driven uh, exactly by the electricity produced uh, uh, by the uh, fuel cell. Uh, in this configuration, which we have flown so far, it also has uh, electrical battery, just to provide the oomph during um, uh, the takeoff. 
and uh, uh, we we conducted our first flight um, uh, at the uh, at the end of September in the, uh, in in 2020 here from uh, uh, our Cranfield base. And uh, now, as I said, uh, our engineers are working on uh, expanding what we have uh, uh, done so far. Um, you know, we had a very good coverage in, uh, in the news, as I said, uh, with the Minister of Aviation visiting us uh, in our first um, uh, flight. It was quite nerve-breaking because uh, in, uh, uh, the day before, we weren't sure if we would be able to, uh, uh, to make it uh, uh, because of the weather and other considerations. Uh, but uh, we did it, and um, uh, you know, we uh, our mission was uh, quite short. As I said, it was uh, on the combination of the fuel cell and the battery uh, for about uh, uh, let's say about ten minutes. And uh, currently, what uh, uh, we are working is uh, to uh, we installed additional uh, uh, hydrogen tanks, which uh, will allow us to achieve uh, much much uh, longer missions, which are about uh, uh, two hundred between two hundred and uh, three hundred nautical miles. So this is up to five hundred kilometers uh, mission which will uh, uh, be conducted uh, with, uh, again, with the hybrid configuration when we use uh, uh, a hydrogen fuel cell and the battery during the takeoff, and then we switch completely to hydrogen for the rest of the flight uh, to, um, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, we have the range. We uh, use um, uh, hydrogen about, uh, uh, I would say, uh, in, this, uh, in these missions, uh, we compared to the batteries, we don't use a lot of fuel. So for about 500 nautical miles or 500 uh, kilometers, we use about uh, 10 kilos of hydrogen, just due to the fact that uh, uh, it has a very good uh, energy density, which uh, you remember at the beginning of this discussion, I mentioned that batteries wouldn't be able to make it. But with the hydrogen, which is about three times more energy dense uh, than even the jet fuel, which is used today, uh, we, can, uh, we can achieve uh, this, uh, these missions. And um, uh, in uh, Cranfield, we actually made uh, uh, the first uh, uh, hydrogen airport, the, uh, the refueling ecosystem, which we uh, realized uh, also last year. So it consists of uh, electrolyzer, which I uh, discussed about um, uh, at the beginning of this, uh, of this presentation. It, it has a, a very small um, uh, production capacity of about uh, four kilos, but given that we need to have uh, uh, about uh, 15 kilos uh, uh, per hour mission, uh, 10 to 15 kilos per mission, you know, it's, uh, we can produce it for a couple of days, then we transfer it in, uh, in our hydrogen uh, refueler, which you can see here on the top, and then, uh, of course, transfer it uh, into, um, uh, into our uh, hydrogen electric um, um, uh, aircraft. And also, we wanted to, uh, uh, together with this uh, aircraft, we wanted to um, uh, fuel our uh, hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cell car, which is, uh, you know, uh, behaves uh, or, or drives uh, uh, very similar to, uh, to what we implemented in, the, in the, our aircraft. So um, uh, we are using Toyota Mirai hydrogen electric car, with, uh, uh, which we fuel from the same re refueler. So this actually shows uh, a very nice demonstration of uh, how this hydrogen ecosystem at the airport can, uh, uh, can, can uh, go forward. For example, as I said, uh, it, we, we, we produce hydrogen in situ, then we use it for, uh, uh, for the air transportation and uh, whatever is left, uh, we can use uh, for the ground transportation. And we are discussing with multiple airports uh, here in the UK, of uh, how we can uh, actually uh, implement that. And earlier today, for example, uh, I had discussion with one airport. Yesterday, we had uh, a discussion with another airport on uh, how we introduce a, a big electrolyzer, uh, which we can uh, partially use for both types of um, uh, transportation. And uh, what I just discussed uh, in this uh, little blue bird of the six seat aircraft, which, is, uh, which has flown uh, uh, in September, and which we will fly later, uh, I think uh, sometime in April, we will have this uh, 500 uh, uh, kilometer mission. We, th this is just the beginning. Uh, we also started uh, uh, the 19 seat aircraft uh, uh, project, which will allow us to uh, actually carry 
uh, uh, up to uh, 19 uh, passengers uh, on the 500 uh, uh, mile uh, mission. And uh, this aircraft, the 19 seat aircraft is already the minimum uh, aircraft um, or, uh, airframe size which uh, is uh, commercially relevant. So some of the, our sub-regional uh, uh, airlines already use this type of aircraft. So for example, Dornia 228 or Twin Order, uh, which um, uh, for example, used up north by Logan Air or down south by Orini uh, in island hopping, uh, in, uh, in short, uh, uh, in the airports where it's required short takeoff uh, um, uh, and, uh, and landing missions, et cetera, et cetera. So, and, and this, is, this is what we are working on now with the commercial introduction in about uh, uh, three years at the beginning of 2024. And in parallel, we are also kicking off a much bigger uh, program, which will target um, uh, something between 50 and 100 seat uh, aircraft, which will, uh, of course, uh, do similar type of mission between 500 miles and uh, about 1,000 miles. So this is, as I said, just the beginning, but we are excited to be a part of this uh, uh, journey. Uh, we, we are happy to actually show to the big guys uh, like um, uh, Rolls-Royce, Airbus, that, uh, you know, this is, um, you know, we need the, and uh, we can do small steps. We can uh, bring our aircraft in the air and uh, start uh, demonstrating this, uh, uh, you know, hydrogen uh, in the air uh, uh, mission. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm open to any questions you have. So Guy, thank you so much. Again, you know, what's wonderful about what both you and William have shown us is that this isn't about some kind of concept. This isn't an ambition that is all about just an idea. It's about the reality of things that, that are working. Um, and I think, you know, that that's, that's always something people love to see. They love to see ideas in action. Um, so, so that's fantastic. Um, I can't actually see anybody here with me at the moment. So I'm not sure where Sir Guy and William have gone. Um, so, oh, you are there, William. Oh, good. Sir Guy, are you still there? Yes, you are. Great. Okay. I was still sharing the presentation. So. Yeah, no, no problem. Well, William, well, well, welcome back. And um, yeah, I feel like you just went outside and went to the future and you've now come back to the present. Um, so that, that was, thank, thank you both for fascinating um, discussion and presentation. So we, we have got lots of questions. Um, here's one that the guy doesn't, uh, Doug doesn't want to ask it. He's happy for me to do so. Um, uh, Sagai, so have you considered using a capacitor instead of a battery for the oomph for takeoff? In other words, are you agnostic to, to these things? You've gone down the route of um, hydrogen fuel cell, but could you have hybrid? Could you have battery and fuel cell? So, so uh, at the big, so so uh, the the phase we are in right now is we are using both battery and the fuel cell, and then as I said, we will turn the. The, the battery off and we will fly on the fuel cell because it will provide us the range. But right. uh, uh, actually in the 19 seat aircraft, we will not have even the battery, okay? Right. So our, our final configuration will, uh, will have uh, no batteries whatsoever. It will be just uh, just the fuel cell. In terms of using the capacitors, capacitors um, are good at delivering, uh, you know, very, uh, focused uh, boost uh, in, in terms of power, but they cannot last uh, for about uh, two to three minutes, which we require during uh, the takeoff, okay? So yes. in that sense, uh, you know, it's, it's a great technology, but uh, un unfortunately it's not uh, very useful for, uh, uh, for, our, uh, for our takeoff, which is yes. quite, quite long. And, and, and flight only has three things to get right. Let's be honest, takeoff, flying and landing. I mean, you know, how difficult can it be? <laughs> um, so look, I'm going to invite a few people up to the stage to ask. Um, uh, uh, Atoala um, has a number of questions. So there you are, Atoala, you're on the stage. I think you're about to be unmuted. So Sagai and William are there for you. Please fire away. Question from the WG. But um, for William, um, first of all, thank you both. Um, it was really interesting, really inspiring, cutting edge stuff. Um, William, given the, the, the smaller size of cargo uh, compared to the, the current um, UPS FedEx delivery trucks, do you think there's going to be any sort of shift in the 
topic landscape, if vehicles like cargo are becoming more mainstream and more popular, do you think like um, it'll be something just like they'll basically just replace the trucks or there'll be, because you'll need more of them to deliver the same amount of packages. Do you think there needs to be new considerations in terms of traffic infrastructure? Yeah, so, so there are some very little known facts in our industry. So did you know that 80% of all packages are shoebox size and smaller? And so we as startups or when innovators try to effect change, we try to solve the biggest problem felt by the highest number of people. And with most packages being so small, it didn't make sense for us to go to a huge van for a second reason. Now, did you know that up to 40% of vans in London run less than half capacity? Um, this is simply because of the pressure of next day delivery, next day delivery. So most of these large vans are empty more than half the time because Amazon will deliver that same day. Buy it now, it'll be there at 10 p.m. tonight. But this is subsidized by their billions, so they'll pay for it happily. However, we pay for it at the environmental cost. So when we were devising cargo, we thought, well, if it's a small electric car and it costs me less than a penny a mile, I could send this little robot back and forth 24-7. Um, and the only cost is probably the roads, but then again, it's so lightweight um, and we know where the roads, which routes to take in real time anyway. So this is why we felt a smaller form factor makes sense for the problem we're trying to solve. We're not looking to solve freight across, across towns. It's specifically that last mile delivery residential areas in which a small form factor makes the best sense. Uh, um, I didn't know that actually. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, so, okay, sorry. I was wondering, um, since you're using hydrogen fuel cells and water, uh, water vapor is a sort of byproduct of well, it's the only byproduct of this uh, technology, do you guys have any consideration into how you're going to deal with this byproduct? Because ultimately, water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and although it's not a sort of, it's not the first concern. Do you think, uh, do you plan to just release it? Yeah, Atuala, we, we can't actually hear you very well, um, I'm afraid. I don't know if you're a, a long way from your microphone. I think I got the question about uh, the, the, the water vapors is a by, by, byproduct of the fuel cell. And, uh, oh, okay, right, good. Impact. Uh, yes, yeah, sir, that. Thank sure, you. It's, uh, it is, uh, water vapor is, uh, is a greenhouse gas. Although uh, the difference between the typical aircraft contrails and uh, the fuel cell byproduct uh, is that uh, uh, the byproduct of the fuel cells is uh, the micro droplets, which uh, actually can be collected and uh, we can uh, we can output in them in the sort of uh, in the high altitudes. It will be micro crystals, we will, which we will just uh, hold out as uh, as a snow, and they will not. Uh, uh, be accumulated up there in the stratosphere. But uh, in general, I would say that um, uh, up till now, nobody did this uh, research about uh, the, the impact of uh, the fuel cell byproducts uh, in the air, but we would uh, uh, estimate that it would be significantly less than uh, something like uh, 10 or 5% of, uh, of, 5 of uh, the, the contrails of what, uh, what, we, um, uh, what we have now. Okay, so, and uh, frankly, yeah, I'm driving Toyota Mirai, and uh, in Toyota Mirai, there is this button, you know, you press on H2O, and there is water coming out of the, uh, out of the pipe. So I think that uh, going forward, we can uh, think about some sort of arrangement where we can accumulate this, uh, uh, this water, condense this water, and I think the, the good thing is that the outside air is pretty cold, uh, uh, at minus, uh, whatever, 50 degrees, uh, something like that. And uh, we can accumulate that and uh, then either hold it or speed it out uh, in the form of um, sort of, um, you know, uh, more, you know, something chunkier, chunkier substances with a much uh, significantly smaller environmental impact. Thank you. That's a very, very good answer, um, Sagai. Th thank you very much. Thank you for the question, A A Atola. That's very good. I'd like to invite Anthony up on the stage uh, to ask his question, I think, for William. And by the way, William, just before Anthony comes up, you've got a very impressive bookcase there. Uh, I have to say, you know, I, I, we all look at people's bookcases now, don't we? That's impressive. Yeah, tidy, oh, fairly neat, you know, quite impressive. Um, Anthony, you've got a question for William, I believe. Just a very simple question, really. I just wonder whether you're aware of or had any, anything to do with um, the 
a robot delivery service in Milton Keynes. Does that ring a bell? Uh, yes, I am aware of it. There's several companies. So Milton Keynes has got a great test bed for all sort of autonomous machines. These are robots, cars and all that. Um, we're actually doing a trial in Milton Keynes ourselves where we're testing 5G for, for instantaneous control. So you saw our safety driver earlier. Yes. Um, what we're doing next in the next few months is we're getting rid of the physical safety driver there in the car right. and they're going to be in a remote location. The reason is the UK law currently, guidelines currently state that to have an autonomous car on the road should be street legal. Skilled operator must be able to take control at any time. Hmm. However, he doesn't need to be in the vehicle. So ah. we're actually doing stuff in Milton Keynes as well ourselves where we are going to be switching to 5G um, instantaneous control a normal driver because we think we're further ahead than most in the UK. Um, well, it would make sense that we are because we're the ones with the products on the road right now. <laughs> so yeah, that's the next stage for us. So yes, I'm aware of the robots. Um, they're knee-high robots and they're limited to four miles an hour while we can go to, at 60 miles an hour. Oh, wow, wow, I've got a difference there. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Anthony, great question. Do you know Street Drone in uh, Oxford, um, William? Yes, I know them very well, um, Mr. Potts, yeah. I know Street yeah, Drone. yeah, and-, and Street, Street Drone, yeah. Yeah, and Mark, Mark Preston, the Formula Formula E dude and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Look, there's, good, yeah. there's so much innovation and it's great there's competition because it means you all try harder to make sure you oh, get absolutely. there first. No, yeah, good. Drone, great, great product, great for education. And um, they're, they're doing slightly different to us. But yeah, no, great product. Yes, yes. Um, so um, Nikolai Zelenikov, hopefully Nikolai is around. Um, if not, I will ask his question. He is, good. He's just come to the stage. So Nikolai, I think your question is is for Sergei. So would you like to um, ask it? Hi there, yeah. Um, so my question is, um, how much quieter have you found the hydrogen-powered uh, turboprop when compared to traditional fuels? And do you think that um, if it has been uh, quieter, that the amount of flights taken um, during a, a 24 hour period could be increased um, because you could potentially avoid the noise regulations? Good question. So, thank, you. thank you, Nikolai. This is a very good question. And uh, actually when we're discussing it with the airports, it's uh, especially with the small airports close to the, uh, to the cities, it's becoming more and more relevant. And, uh, we, uh, if, if you think about this, uh, when uh, we turn uh, the engine, we can hear only the propeller noise, okay? We don't have the engine noise. And uh, what it means is that uh, if, uh, if the aircraft uh, sort of passes by, you don't hear pretty much anything, okay? So uh, close to the aircraft, we estimate that uh, the decrease in noise is at least 6 dB. We didn't uh, do very uh, detailed studies, but this is our estimates. And uh, of course, uh, working with the airports, this is one of the things uh, which, uh, which comes into the discussion. So for example, with Heathrow, when we talk to them, they say that we have a noise charge. And they say that uh, you know, going to the, from, uh, from the traditional aviation to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, hydrogen uh, electric, uh, you know, that uh, my A, uh, decrease the uh, the airport charges and uh, b expand the hours of uh, uh, of operations and uh, for example the same thing is about the london city airport which uh, as you know uh, it, it has very limited hours of operation just because of that um, that issue mm. yeah i think that's a very important question i mean pollution is in many forms and noise pollution is definitely one of them uh, for sure i don't know if frank is around frank uh, desinis um if he is he's welcome to come up to the stage and ask uh we'll make a point a sort of last last question oh frank you are with us uh, lovely to see you there i know we've had a few exchanges on linkedin and the like so um you want to talk a little bit about sustainable aviation fuel um and a little bit about what you know is going on with airbus i believe so i guess you want i'm, I'm going to guess you want to talk to sergey about that no, no, I, I made the comment about, sorry, uh, I made the comment about uh, the sustainable fuel uh, in reference to the discussion earlier. No, I know very oh. well Zero Avia, I'm, I'm very impressed by, by what this, they're doing, and I'm sure it's going to be a, a very strong uh, player in the aerospace field uh, in the coming years. Uh, I think the, the, the key element for, for, for Zero Avia is going to be the, the capacity to uh, to demonstrate in flight over the time, uh, the range and the, 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 the capacity to certify. Sergey, one question in terms of uh, certification path with uh, the, the authorities, and I think it's going to be the CAA for you. 
do you have a certification baseline discussed or negotiated or agreed with, uh, with them to date? So currently we are working with the UK CAA, of course, uh, on, uh, on this path and uh, they're very excited to work with us. Uh, for them, it's uh, one of the ways to prove that uh, after, after Brexit, um, uh, UK CAA can be uh, uh, maybe even the first to certify hydrogen electric powertrain. So we are, we are currently working with them on setting up uh, the, um, uh, the set of rules and, uh, and standards to, uh, uh, to, uh, to show the safety of, uh, uh, of our powertrain and uh, then, uh, uh, of course, uh, means, to, uh, uh, means of compliance to those, uh, uh, at this point, uh, hypothetical uh, uh, rules and standards, but also we are participating in different working groups of SAI and EUROCHI to actually uh, make sure that uh, the, uh, you know, the, the, the standards which have been developed now are <laughs> reflecting uh, the reality, right? So that it's, uh, they're not prohibitively, um, uh, you know, strict and uh, not possible to comply with. Okay, um, great work. Great. Hey, um, we've got, we've, thank you, Frank. No, no, merci bien, Frank. Uh, I like to speak a bit of French, you know, make, it makes it feel like it's all international. Um, th well, thank, thank, thank you. Merci. Um, Daria has, I think, the final question here. Um, so, yeah, if you could, oh, there's Dar Daria. So, you're welcome to the stage. I think you've got a question, again, in one first, Sergei. I've got some for you, William, before we wrap up, by the way, so don't feel left out. Um, so, yes, uh, Daya, off you go. Thank you. Um, Sergei, what will be the greatest challenge to mass producing zero avia planes in the future? So, um, I, I think that uh, for us, uh, I would say that, um, uh, l l let's say, uh, in order to get to the production and, uh, and, and have production at scale, we have to, of course, uh, solve uh, a couple of um, uh, challenges. One is uh, uh, the um, uh, uh, implement on the roadmap uh, in terms of the uh, power and energy density. And this is what we are working very, uh, very much right now from the technical standpoint. Number two is uh, what Frank already mentioned is certification because it's, uh, we have uh, uh, you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty racy um, uh, timeline. And uh, number mm -hmm. three, we need to build up uh, all the value chain in terms of, uh, uh, you know, not only producing, but also modifying electro, uh, you know, uh, uh, airframes to install uh, uh, our powertrains, but also teach pilots and uh, the maintenance and uh, repair organizations uh, to make sure that they know how to operate uh, the, uh, our uh, powertrain, hydrogen powertrain. It will be very similar to what uh, exists today, but still there will be certain differences. So I think that those, uh, those three from the, uh, you know, from the uh, airframe, I would say, or certification standpoint, but uh, the last one is probably uh, the introduction of the, or build up of the hydrogen infrastructure at scale so that uh, we don't get constrained like me on, uh, on uh, my um, uh, Mirai uh, hydrogen fuel <laughs> in, uh, in the UK, where we have only like, uh, you know, 10 uh, uh, fueling stations. Yeah, indeed. A bit of a challenge at the moment with a car, it has to be said. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for last very good question. Uh, great answers again. William, I'd like to come to you in that, um, it's it is it seemed for a long time I think for a lot of people that autonomous vehicles and robotics and all of this it just was all just science fiction it wasn't science fact but now you're putting them on the road you're doing that we've just seen it um, you know how quickly do you think we're going to get to a point where it's ubiquitous where where we really have that world all around us and almost we don't take any notice anymore is it twenty years is it ten years five years what would you say um, I would say. Um, we're looking at up to 10 years. The reason why 10 years specifically is unlike the iPhones, when we went from these brick phones to um, a brand new iPhone, then in the space of six months to a year, we're all at iPhones. This is because everyone tends to change their phone every year anyway. So with cars, it takes about maybe seven to 10 years. You're holding onto a car and then you get rid of it. So if you buy a new car today, a nice new Merc or a nice new Tesla, whatever it may be, if a brand new amazing autonomous car comes out. You're not going to suddenly get rid of your car like you do at your phone. <laughs> um, so there's that sort of gradual switch over 
that will happen as like with phones, it's just that instead of one year, we're looking at a 10 year cycle. So mm. I think the idea that cars are autonomous will be ubiquitous within five years. But the idea that industrial cars, such as deliveries and all that is more like two years as we're the ones starting it. And we know the pace we're going at, the pace our competitors are going at. And it seems now let's all automate the big trucks, the logistics vehicles, all that, that comes first. And then for consumers a few years after. Do you know what you both represent and what you've just exemplified by exactly as you, as you laid that out there, William, is the audacity of hope. Um, I read a book uh, about, about that a couple of years ago from a, a chap and uh, yeah, the audacity of hope. Nothing changes in this world and people, unless people are audacious, unless they hope to have something different. And you're both examples of that. I know obviously you both represent companies. You've got teams of people. It's not just you as individuals, but you know, leadership and example and all of that is pretty crucial and important. So just to a kind of quick 60 seconds of, you know, what your business is going to be like in a few years time and how hopeful you are of the future, given the really challenging, you know, year or so that we've all been experiencing. Can you give us that sense and flavor of hope, Sergey? Can, can you do that for me in, say, 60 seconds, if that's possible? Then I'll come and finish with William. So our aspiration is to have a hydrogen, uh, a hydrogen electric uh, 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 aircraft flying from um, all over the UK and, uh, and, uh, and, and the rest of the world. And uh, it's, uh, the, the, the output of, uh, of that is just uh, pure water coming uh, down on people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like it. I like it. William, um, I've kind of, yeah. Sure. W give us that sense of hope, please, because we all want as much of that as possible at the moment, don't we? Sure. So my name is William. I'm the founder of the Academy of Robotics. In 2020, my team and I were the first company in Europe to have a street legal made for autonomous vehicle to be on the road here in the UK. These vehicles started semi-autonomously delivering medicines from pharmacies to care homes, and they're on the road, as was seen in my presentation earlier. The important takeaway I'd like to give is that we live in a world full of algorithms, artificial intelligence, and they're all trying to sell you something, push you this way, make you buy this. Whereas with us, we make artificial intelligences there when it's needed and out of the way when it isn't. So think an autonomous delivery vehicle, it delivers grandma's medicine, then it goes back home and that's its job done. And that's the sort of AI assisted future I'd like us all to live in. Wow. Wow. Well, look, you've both finished off an amazing uh, session that we've had today, a whole you know bunch of speakers and panels and Q&As from a fantastic audience. Um, so I'd like to thank you both very much. Wish you both all the best uh, with your businesses um, and that ambition. Uh, there's certainly no shortage of hope and there's certainly no shortage of um, vision in what you're both doing. So good luck with all of that. And um, we'll see you all again another time soon, I'm sure. So for now, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up. Um, we're on schedule, which is amazing, given how much I bundle on sometimes uh, but thank you if you've joined us all the way through if you joined us at some point during that that's fine too and if you're still here well done um i'd like to thank all of our speakers julia ian um imogen daniel bob graham sergey and william just then um and i'd particularly like to thank uh, georgina mcgiven who put the whole thing together it was her idea she got all the speakers um together and has done all the stuff behind the scenes here uh, to make it work and Camden Clean Air Initiative is something that um, I have a lot of belief and a passion for because the air quality around us, as I think a few speakers have mentioned during today, um, impacts mostly on poorer people, on people that live in sometimes areas of a bit more de deprivation. You might not think that's the case in London, central London. It's a myth to think everyone that lives there has got a ton of money. Um, so I think anything that works towards improving that is, is absolutely fantastic. So thank you for all the speakers and giving us some flavor of how that can improve. Um, and thank you to you for listening in. Uh, if you came up and asked some questions, um, that was great. It was lovely to hear so many different voices. Um, but for now, um, from the uh, luxury of my garden shed, 
Um, uh, we will see you all sometime soon, I'm sure. But thank you for your time and thank you for listening and see you again. Bye bye.